Hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this final webinar on WKO Plus 4.0, The New Science. We are really excited to be doing the fourth one. So this is a series of four. The other three are recorded. So if you'd like to go back and listen to them, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, just a couple housekeeping items before I turn it over. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, go ahead and enter it into the question area of the go to control panel. Um, myself and Tim Cusick from the WKO group is also going to be answering um, some questions as um, Dr. Coggin goes through stuff. And the, this is being recorded, and we are also going to make the slides available. So that will be either on Wednesday or later this week. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Coggin. Thank you, Melissa, and welcome back, everybody, who has managed to last through uh, three of these previous webinars to finally get to the one where we talk about what it can do for you. Uh, that is the power duration model that's uh, uh, going to be in WKO4. Um, but just very quickly to, to review, uh, I started out with uh, this question, and that is, why bother to try and develop a mathematical model of the power duration relationship? If we've got a power meter on our bike that is collecting data almost second by second, why not just plot all those dots on a curve and maybe connect them with a nice little, you know, interpolated line like we've all been doing since, uh, well, let's see, I guess since cycling peaks in uh, 2003 when uh, Hunter and Kevin uh, uh, developed uh, the mean and coined the term mean maximal power chart. Um, well, the answer to that. Uh, was that if you have a, a good mathematical description of that uh, of an individual's power duration relationship, it gives you quantitative insight into their uh, their unique abilities, and it opens the way for uh, additional analyses. And I use this Parthenon figure to try and illustrate that concept, uh, where the power duration model being the foundation at the bottom, and and that serves as the basis for a number of things that uh, I'd like to do that are, are being implemented in WKO4 and are planned for the future, assuming they, they meet the, our standards. Um, all of which in some total is going to give us a, a more individualized approach to power-based training than what we've had to date. So in that first talk, I, uh, I listed a variety of potential uses for the power duration model. Again, some of them uh, already implemented in WKO4, some of them planned for the future, some of them may or may not make it off the uh, cutting room floor, uh, and also quite possible that there are other applications that haven't been thought of yet uh, that somebody else may uh, come forward. What comes to mind here is the way uh, Endurance Nation, the triathlon group, and I'm trying to remember Rich, Kimmer Rich's last name and the people behind that recognized that a benchmark TSS of I think they use 275 to 300 as a target for an Ironman distance triathlon was a good uh, metric that allowed people to complete the ride in good shape and still have it set them up for a decent run. Now that's not a uh, application of TSS that I ever envisioned when I came up with the idea and it isn't necessarily perfect but it is a it does seem to be a quite useful uh, guideline and I applaud them for thinking of that idea and so it's quite possible by the same by you know, the same path somebody out there is going to take this power duration modeling uh, and the metrics from it and find other applications as well. But what I thought I would do tonight is more to give you a, a potpourri of applications here to try and uh, stimulate your thinking, whet your appetite, give you some insight into why I think this is such an important, um, I don't want to say step forward, such an important uh, background uh, for a lot of different things that we need to do. That Again, to come back to this Parthenon figure, if you're trying to uh, use the some sort of mathematical description of the relationship between power and duration and your model isn't very good, then you're building on a your house on sand and it may very well fall down. 
Whereas if you've got a very robust description of that power duration relationship, then you're uh, in much better shape when you go off to do other calculations. But before going through that list, uh, I thought I would just remind everybody of the uh, definitions of some of these terms because we're introducing some new terminology here. Functional threshold power, of course, is not new. P max, I think, is also pretty self-evident. It's just a maximal power that can be generated for a short period of time. Um, functional reserve capacity, or FRC, is the one that I think people will probably find uh, or will probably be uh, garnering the most attention. And I joked on the Training and Racing with a Power Meter Facebook page some time back that uh, you know, what, would, what would not be the most asked question amongst uh, savvy power meter using cyclists in 2014 and what uh, up until now has probably been the uh, uh, most asked question is what's your FTP? Well in 2014 uh, I anticipate it's going to be well what's your FRC? So uh, to get that into your vocabulary it's being defined here is the total amount of work that can be done during continuous exercise above FTP before fatigue occurs that the units would be kilojoules or joules per kilogram. Um, and last week we talked about the similarities and differences uh, between FRC and anaerobic work capacity or W prime calculated using the uh, now classic, I guess you would say, uh, Monod share critical power model. So you can review the uh, uh, previous uh, webinar uh, to see why uh, I felt there was a need for a new term here. All right, so to return to our list, and we'll just start from the top and wind our way through them. Automatic estimation of functional threshold power is one thing that the power duration model gives you the ability to do. And I showed this slide previously, uh, demonstrating that the model-derived FTP agrees quite nicely with somebody's uh, power during a, a, a time trial of reasonable length i.e. the model seems to nail it quite well, um, provided you feed it uh, enough data, or enough good data, I should say. Um, so I think that that uh, aspect, that uh, utility to the uh, modeling approach is pretty obvious. It's really uh, nice to think that you could just uh, you know, let the software provide you a good guess of what your FTP is, and hopefully, help guide all the newbies out there, for example, uh, who are constantly posting, well, what's my FTP? I did this workout, I did that workout, etc. Um, you know, that's not to say that the model's going to nail it absolutely every single time and that having the modeling will entirely, or the modeling, uh, the ability to uh, model and auto-estimate FTP will necessarily completely eliminate the need to do formal testing, but hopefully it will uh, reduce the burden somewhat. Uh, and at a minimum provides sort of a sanity check of any sort of uh, values that people come up with other ways. Um, and then to address a question of somebody last week, they asked, well, how does the model-derived FTP compare to using 95% of 20-minute power uh, via Hunter's uh, protocol? And first thing I would point out is that you got to remember that Hunter's protocol has a uh, specifically scripted warm-up routine that includes some uh, sharp short efforts as well as a five-minute blowout uh, period uh, before you do a 20-minute time trial. And I have to confess, I've never actually done that protocol, but looking at it on paper, you'd have to expect that it would take the edge off a little bit. You wouldn't be able to put out quite as much power during a, an all-out 20-minute effort uh, if that was your uh, warm-up compared to if you just came into it as if it were an all-out 20-minute TT. Uh, be that at, and perhaps because of that, other people have suggested if you're going to use, say, a 10-mile time trial time or power from somebody in the UK, they're using a factor of maybe 93% instead of 95%. Well, obviously, the exact uh, relationship varies from individual to individual, depending uh, in part on their FRC. But just to show you by comparison, someone asked last week how, it, how they uh, matched up. So I uh, went and pulled out everybody's best uh, 
20 minute power in this database I've been playing with, calculated 95% of that, and you can see that the regression line falls almost exactly on the line of identity with a standard error of the estimate of 1.7 watts. So on average, and again, as I said last week, you can think of the auto FTP and all the other FTP tests that have been out there, including the seven deadly sins, as all honing in on the same number. So it's not like we're changing the, uh, <clears throat> I don't want to say changing the foundation here. We're just finding, uh, I guess you could call this the eighth deadly sin, a model derived estimate. Um, again, though, note there is scatter about the, uh, about the line. Uh, some individuals can do more power for 20 minutes than uh, you'd expect. Sorry, they can do more power for 20 minutes and even 95% of their 20 minute power is more than you would expect based on their FTP because their FRC is high and other people are a little bit below. So although the uh, although the, the mean line falls directly along the line of identity the, uh, there is still individual variation there. Uh, another uh, thing that the model gives you is a calculation of Pmax. And again, this isn't uh, all that exciting or necessarily earth shattering uh, in that uh, we already have a pretty good idea on what somebody's maximal power is just by looking, well, what was the power they could maintain for say one second. Uh, but having a model derived estimate uh, can be helpful in spotting obvious outliers and sometimes spotting uh, not so obvious outliers. So again, here's comparing the, uh, the maximal one second power against the model derived P max and you can see the regression line falls nicely along the line of identity for all the blue points, but you know, clearly power meter malfunction, power meter malfunction, power meter malfunction. In which case it's nice to have the model to come up with a decent estimate of their of somebody's true maximal power uh, even when you haven't measured it over such a short duration. Um, it's also makes you start to wonder in this particular case or these particular cases I didn't investigate them all that closely to see why the model was coming up with a lower value but it's possible that these are, are also uh, power meter distortions as well. I mean, after all, if you think back to why the classic power profiling tables are based on five second power and not one second power is because of the long standing recognition that uh, power meters are uh, challenged, I should, I guess I would put it, uh, to be able to measure power with great accuracy over very short durations. Uh, uh, five seconds then being a compromise between you know, a little bit longer more data, less noise, versus if you go too long, fatigue actually starts to set in and people's power is decreasing and you underestimate their true capability. Um, so that's why we picked five seconds in the first place. Now we have a modeling approach as, as another way of sort of smoothing out some of that uh, noise at short durations. And I'll come back to this point again. Going to spend the meat of the time tonight talking about functional reserve capacity and the things you can put it, uh, the uses to which you can put it. Um, but I want to remind people first off, if you go all the way back to the wattage list in 2002 when I raised the, the concept of the critical power model for the very first time, uh, I made the point that being able to use a mathematical model to differentiate between uh, non sustainable and sustainable power output. Uh, provides you a way of gaining greater insight into somebody's abilities, how they respond to training, the demands of events, etc. cetera. Uh, unfortunately, it's an idea that I don't think really caught on all that well. You don't see that many people who are talking about their W prime and it only has become popular uh, and people start, seem to have started thinking about it maybe in the last uh, year or two, even though you know the issue was first brought up over 10 years ago. Well, if I thought back then that there was a potential to, uh, to try and uh, differentiate between sustainable and non-sustainable power using a mathematical model, I think there's a lot more potential now that we have a, a better model that does uh, a better job of describing the power duration relationship over uh, much longer uh, spans of time. Uh, the classic critical power model is good for maybe you know, one order of magnitude from 100 
roughly to a thousand seconds, uh, whereas the the new model in WKO4 uh, is good and is robust enough that it can uh, describe things over five orders of magnitude. So it gives us uh, a little more uh, solid foundation upon which to draw any conclusions. So then I showed some examples of this uh, in the calculation of FRC. Uh, this is changes in my FRC across 13 years of training calculated using the new model. Uh, FRC being in the, the uh, red line here. And I was explaining how during this period uh, from 2000, I got a power meter for the first time and power tap for the first time in 1999, but they weren't downloadable until 2000. And I'd actually had used an SRM briefly in 96, thanks to my friend Jim Martin, but not enough to really uh, build up much of a database or anything. Um, so from data from 2000 to 2002, I'm doing you know mass start road racing. Uh, and then uh, during this period of time, I was training for the individual pursuit, trying my wife's event. And of course, I'm as a pursuiter, I'm just really a time trial as, uh, masquerading as a pursuiter. Um, but you can see with some dedicated attention to you know, level six intervals how my FRC increases. Uh, then took a couple years in which I did no real uh, training whatsoever in that I had no goals. And I don't even know if I remember race. Maybe I raced one or two times during these years. Uh, 2008, 2009, I was focusing on time trialing. Uh, John Verhuel and I went after the, uh, the tandem 90-plus record uh, out in Moriarty at his instigation, and then I went back the following year to take a shot at the 50-plus record and fell short. Uh, but, you know, if you're training for time trials, you don't do a lot of level six intervals, so you kind of think about, yeah, you're kind of drifting downward, right? Then I spent a period of time where I was uh, lifting weights, doing plyometrics, jumping on our kid's trampoline, and maybe only riding you know, three or four days a week on average. And you can see my FRC fell uh, during that year, year and a half, roughly. Then I developed, uh, as I said last week, developed a bit of an ingrown toenail and couldn't do any more jumping and pressing. So rather than being completely sedentary, got back in, on the bike and you know, haven't gotten off since. And so I'm starting to climb my way back up, at least so I hope. Uh, although whether I can ever match what I could when I was younger is another story. Um, and here, as, as per usual, I like to use my wife's data just because she had such dramatic changes and it makes a good story. But here's development of her functional reserve capacity over four years from her first year as uh, racing and then year two, three, and four focusing on the individual pursuit. Um, Year four, she won elite nationals. Uh, but you can see how FRC is going upward, but especially in year four. And this is, in fact, you know, this is what made the difference that year. Uh, what was just uh, an average ability became a superb strength. Uh, so all credit to her uh, coach, uh, Lucy Tyler Sharman, and training group in uh, T-Town that year. Um, Digging a little deeper, I've taken her season uh, since I know when she changed her, the foci of her training and broke it up into periods that were not equal in length, but uh, more based on what she was doing at the time. So the, the build phase, I say end of build phase, this is like, you know, what did she get to after four months of training like a, a hard woman roadie, you know, two by 20 intervals all winter long on the ergometer, uh, four to six hour hard road rides with the cat one, two men and, you know, the quasi races that people do on the weekends in the southeast. Uh, then moving into road racing season, which was pretty much what you think of as you know, race and recover mode, uh, where you're racing quite frequently, but you don't have much opportunity to do a lot of structured training. And you can see her functional reserve capacity increases quite a bit as a result. Uh, what's more interesting, though, is the further increase she gets when she starts to do track-specific training more along the lines of what I like to describe as go hard, puke, go home sort of intervals, um, rather than repetitions with very short recovery like a roadie might do. And then uh, a three week or so, two week or so period of tapering. So you can see FRC doesn't really change while she tapers. And in fact, it's Pmax that goes up. Uh, so having the ability to quantify 
these changes beyond just saying, hey, look, your power duration curve shapes changing and that shelf is moving out a little bit further, uh, I think really does help uh, you gain insight into the most effective way of training and preparing for certain events in a manner that uh, can't be achieved otherwise. Now, that's not to say that, you know, for example, go hard, go puke, or go hard, puke, go home is the best way of increasing your functional reserve capacity, although that might be my personal opinion based on you know, anecdote and observation and tying it back to a few research studies. Uh, the point is that there's now a tool soon to be made available to allow you to reach those determinations on your own. You know, take, a, take this lens, go back and look at uh, prior approaches of training and see what worked and what, it, what hasn't uh, for you, your athletes, what have you. Uh, in much the same way that you know, having a power meter back in you know, 1999 really, um, let's say, cemented my belief in uh, what I now refer to as level four type intervals, even though I had done them throughout my entire racing career ever since the 1970s, uh, went through a period where I was uh, drilling it actually two by four laps on, one lap off, so four laps on, one lap on, four laps off at uh, Columbia uh, Gateway Park, an office park in Columbia, Maryland, where everybody used to go and train on, was it Tuesdays, Wednesdays? I fell into a habit and lo and behold started to see my FTP, my sustainable power, rising as a result. Uh, and therefore, like I said, that cemented my belief in that approach. Uh, something that even though I'd been doing them and thinking they were working uh, for nearly, uh, I guess, you know, 15 years or more at that point, uh, that really drove home the, the ability to actually measure and see the improvements really drove home uh, how effective that approach to training was, at least for me. So much the same way, I expect that having the ability to quantify FRC is going to give people new insight into the best way for them to train for their events that they're interested in. And in fact, uh, there's even the possibility to look back and over time and prepare what we're, we're for the uh, at least at present, referring to it as the power duration history chart in WK04, which I think is a potentially uh, extremely powerful tool. Uh, the, so much so that it needs a uh, it needs a name that's less of a mouthful. Power duration history chart, the PWHC. That's just uh, a little too much. Um, but the ability to look back over time and say, well, what has happened to your FRC? And again, I don't remember the colors, and already this, this beta is out of date. So if I had a screenshot from the current beta that actually has the, the uh, legend, I would know. But I believe it's the red line is showing the FRC for this individual. So rising up over here. It's also reported up in the uh, power duration metrics uh, provided for each athlete. And as an aside, I should say the way you really need to think of these things is uh, this is your apparent Pmax, it's your apparent FRC, it's your apparent FTP. It's what the model thinks it is uh, based on looking back at present, looking back 90 days in time. Um, And it's possible also to provide approximate standards for FRC in joules per kilogram. Uh, and notice I've italicized approximate because these are still subject to revision as I gain more experience with this tool, et cetera. But it's a good starting point to start looking around if you have the opportunity to do the, to play with the program and look at your own data. Um, you can certainly see, you know, my FRC, well, I apologize to everybody out there. I'll have to jump back myself to see what is my FRC. I guess historically it runs around uh, 200, maybe a little more joules per kilogram. 
Yeah. Like I said, this is why I don't make the podium at the uh, at, at Masters Nationals in the pursuit because my functional reserve capacity is uh, average at best uh, even when I train for the pursuit and it's below average when I don't. Um, my wife's on the other hand uh, was uh, up around 400. So yeah, what was a weakness for me was a strength for her. Who knows where our kids will end up, right? Now, FRC is one thing. Dynamic FRC is something else. Uh, so I know a lot of people seem to be confused on this point, so I just want to you know, sort of hammer that home. You can calculate somebody's functional reserve capacity using the mathematical model that's implemented in uh, WK04, but then to talk about uh, rapid changes in uh, FRC or available FRC requires a different additional model, uh, additional assumptions, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really something separate. The roots of this idea actually go back to uh, really, uh, I guess, late 2006 uh, or thereabouts when, uh, actually, no, it would have been, yeah, I guess it would have been late 2006, early 2007 early 2007, Alex Simmons contacted me, wanted to know whether there was any way of analyzing data from uh, Team Pursuit that he had done with his, his mates uh, uh, to try and determine why one rider cracked in the final. Uh, and therefore, you know, I took my stab at it and I was calculating an, or estimating a cumulative O2 deficit uh, based on the scientific literature on maximal accumulated O2 deficit. And you can see here, uh, individual pursuit, their MAOD rises and then pretty much, you know, levels out because they can't uh, do any more work above their maximal sustainable power. Uh, of course, power during a pursuit tends to start out high and then come down to a plateau. When they ride the team pursuit qualifier and they were the leadoff rider, you can see that they have to go out a little bit harder, so their uh, estimated uh, cumulative, o cumulative O2 deficit increases more rapidly. And then they get their chance on the wheels and they recover a little bit, but then they have to pull at the front and then they're on the wheels recovering and they take their turn at the front and then they're on the wheels recovering and they take their turn at the front. And their accumulated o, cumulative O2 deficit never approaches the same maximum value that you see uh, in the uh, individual pursuit. Then they go into the team pursuit final, and Alex figures, okay, in order to win, we need to go a half lap or so, or half second or so per lap faster. And I know Phil knows how to pace himself, so it's Phil's job to set the standard. And you can see they are going faster, so his cumulative O2 deficit rises more rapidly and actually exceeds, uh, at 90 seconds, exceeds what he had, he had suffered, if you will, uh, in an individual pursuit. And then he finally uh, hits the same you know, upper limit with his uh, next to last turn and then can't get on the wheels as the riders go by. And if you want to read more about that, you can go to Alex's blog. Uh, and it's the uh, Darth Vader Rides the Team Pursuit is the name of his blog entry. And here's another example of the same calculations that Alex did later on looking at some of his own data where his maximum accumulated, his maximal cumulative O2 deficit from an individual pursuit is the red line here. In the uh, team pursuit, he digs maybe a little deeper. He says, yeah, um, motivated by competition. Um, just as much burns through it more rapidly in a kilo, but achieves essentially the same upper limit. And then in a points race, decides to follow an initial attack, and they get a gap and they have a breakaway, but it doesn't last because Alex is gassed, and I believe they're caught, and then he has to spend a lot of time groveling on the wheels, recovering before, you know, later on, beyond 300 seconds, maybe having a chance to contest any other sprints. 
So with that, uh, with that as the sort of uh, beginnings of the idea of calculating changes in your non-sustainable reserves on the fly, and then combine that with the fact that we now have a, a new model for calculating your non-sustainable reserves, i.e. your functional reserve capacity. From that, the idea of doing dynamic FRC or DFRC is born. Um, but again, the roots go back to, well, let's see, what, six years or so ago um, when we first started thinking about this. And so here's an example of, of modeling uh, DFRC, which uh, I should mention. One of, one of the reasons this idea, uh, one of the reasons this never really went any further and I didn't pursue it was the fact that it required somebody to have done an individual pursuit or a well-paced uh, prologue type time trial or something similar in order to have a reasonable estimate of their VO2 max and their maximal accumulated O2 deficit on the assumption that they went all out and this sustainable power out here is essentially power at VO2 max. Um, so you didn't have the, uh, for most people, at least uh, for non-endurance trackies, you didn't have the, uh, the baseline value to do calculations of what changes uh, from that point. Well, now we have a model that allows us to give uh, a baseline FRC. What is the functional reserve you, capacity you have at rest before you start uh, killing it? Uh, then you can go off and do this kind of modeling. And so I started playing around with a, a lot of different things. So here's an individual pursuit uh, performed by my wife. And you can see, you know, she starts out at rest and then and as you'd expect if you pace it well you get to zero at the point you fall off the bike right um, that's the ideal here's uh, some more of her data from the same season uh, looking at some track racing so this is the the standard uh, warm-up on the track where everybody joins up in a pace line and the pace gradually picks up and you each take your turn at the front as you count down the laps and then everybody makes a sprint for the line you know as the opener this was a scratch race and you can see it's pretty short uh, she was never a, a great sprinter so she obviously wasn't uh, likely to get much success in the scratch race people just you know hit it hard right from the start and you follow but you aren't going to break away in a really short scratch scratch race and you're just kind of like waiting for it to be over because you're not going to win the sprint either. And then she recovers and then starts a points race. And you can see there's a few short, sharp attacks early on which cause her FRC reserve to drop. And then including some time you can see here where the power stays high. You know, this is probably a bit of a solo attack. And then there's a lull. Everybody slows down, so she's recovering a little bit. Power is low. FRC is rising. And then there's another sprint, another attack, and then a counter. So she gets away solo. So as many people have, you know, most people, if you've ever looked at power meter files, it's pretty easy to tell when somebody's in a solo break is because all of a sudden their power becomes much steadier, like in a TT. And her FRC is dropping, but she can't sustain the breakaway. Notice that we're down around 0% here, maybe even a little bit below, right? But we're down around empty. The gas gauge is saying zero. Um, and at this point, she's caught. She can't do anything. The race as a whole slows down and becomes one of these sort of sit and sprint, sit and sprint, sit and sprint, uh, and starts favoring the true sprinters who then you know, rack up all the points and end up uh, pushing her out of the lead. Um, but because her FRC has become depleted and she never gets enough recovery, even when she tries to make some attacks like right here to go somewhere, you know, they don't. Um, and then recovery. So it seems to be working well in the individual pursuit, it seems to be working very well in, in uh, uh, very uh, uh, stochastic or seemingly stochastic points race if you don't know the story behind it. And then you apply it to some track intervals here. So again, this is uh, warming up. 
and then four by three kilometers flying. And DFRC, if you just look at the pattern, drops, recovers, drops, recovers, drops, recovers, drops, but then doesn't drop as much because they pulled the plug. Uh, my wife was doing these with uh, Colby Pierce sitting on her wheel. They pulled the plug after 2K on this one because they were dropping off pace. Um, so that all looks well and good until you actually look at the scaling over here and you say, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute, you're not supposed to be able to go below 0%. That's just not possible, right? I mean, you want to be able to give 110%, but you can't. 100% is the limit. And of course, if you were plotting this as FRC uh, in absolute values, uh, then you know it would have to go negative. But if you plotted it as uh, depletion, it would just go upward, and you would never notice this impossibility here. So it worked well, and then you know not so well. Here's uh, another rider, different rider entirely. They're doing uh, level five intervals. First one, I think they were five minutes. First one's a little short and a little soft. Next one's harder. Next one's, maybe it was three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, five minutes, I believe. Um, and they drilled it as hard as they could in the second five minute one. So you can see that the average power here is slightly higher than that one here. So they finish on a high note and their FRC goes to zero. Whereas when I, I applied the same modeling approach to my wife's data doing similar duration type events or similar duration efforts, it went below zero. And here's that same rider in the previous slide doing 40 second, 20 second intervals, which while they're often prescribed to simulate racing and there's no question that they're hard, at least it fits with the realization that with such short recovery periods and with the power being not all that high, um, that it's going to be uh, favoring aerobic uh, function or sustainable power as much as non-aerobic function. And sure enough, their FRC doesn't go all the way to zero and they don't have any problem finishing the workout, although I'm sure it was tiring. Um, actually, they went on. This is a as you can see, based on the timeline, this is in the midst of a long ride, and I've only shown you those. They also went off and did uh, 20 on 40 off intervals uh, shortly after this, so they weren't completely wasted yet. So it works all well for that person during uh, uh, long intervals. It works during short intervals, but then when you apply the model to their results from a uh, steadier but still uh, a supra FTP effort, in this case the hill climb at the Joe Martin stage race, uh, yeah, they go negative. And finally, here's some of my data from a criterium. You can see, you know, noisy, noisy, noisy. It was uh, like a four corner criterium with a uh, slightly off camber uh, turn on the downside of the hill. So you were basically sprinting out of turns, jamming into the next one, sprinting out of turns, jamming into the next one. And then, as I said before, you can tell usually when somebody gets away solo, their power tends to level off. And yeah, I went for it. And FRC goes, boom. And I can't sustain the brake, and I'm caught. And I just have to sit the wheels and try and recover and try and recover and try and recover. And of course, not being a sprinter, if I don't get in a breakaway, I'm not going to get any results in a race. So I have to try again later, which I do. So you can see from the white space here, a brief period of being away solo, but FRC dropping rapidly and getting caught. And again, and then at this point, you're like, well, just going to ride it out because you know I can't get away. It's going to come down to a sprint. Might as well you know, be safe. He who runs away lives to race another day, right? So it seems to work okay for a very stochastic effort for me, or seemingly stochastic. But when I try and do uh, level five intervals or apply the model level five intervals, again, my calculated FRC goes negative. <clears throat> the point being that works some of the time, doesn't work in other times. And when I'm able to break the modeling process, 
Uh, there doesn't really seem to be a lot of rhyme nor reason to it. It's not a case of uh, one individual or one particular type of workout. Um, of course, that's, uh, that's understandable when you really start to think about it. One of my uh, sayings ever since I was a graduate student oh so long ago was that fatigue is always multifactorial, always. So from that perspective then, you also realize that recovery from fatigue will always be multifactorial. So for example, failure of excitation contraction coupling is something that reverses quite rapidly. If we didn't have a tremendous ability to reestablish the resting membrane potential of our, of our neurons and our skeletal muscle fibers, uh, then we wouldn't be able to repeatedly call upon the same motor units uh, because they would, uh, the capacitor would run down and not recharge. That's not to say that your ability to recharge that capacitor doesn't improve with, uh, with the right type of training. In fact, it does. But nonetheless, it, it has a very high uh, ability to recharge even in the untrained state. So a very rapid restoration. The time course of uh, restoration of phosphocreatine and high energy phosphate levels, a little bit longer. Time constant, depending on largely on mitochondrial respiratory capacity and oxygen availability of the 15 to 40 second range, depending on whether you're talking about you know, highly trained endurance athletes or some sort of diseased population. Um, the time course or the time constant for the restoration of muscle pH, which can gum up the works quite a bit and can also shift the equilibrium state of the Lohmann reaction, is quite a bit longer, on the order of about 300 seconds. And then you start thinking about, well, what about uh, R.H.T. Edwards' notion of uh, low frequency fatigue, high frequency fatigue, and the reduced performance ability that comes as a result of muscle damage, such as running a marathon, but also, you know, pound yourself enough on the bike, quite possibly as well. Uh, well, the time constant there for recovery, might, uh, that fatigue might be measured on the order of days. That may be one way, if you want to think about it, that may be uh, part and parcel of the same observation that our maximal sprint power, our Pmax, is most responsive to tapering and being fresh. You know, if you want to knock some, uh, if you want to knock off, you know, 100 watts off your sprint power, go out and ride, you know, 100 miles a day for five or six days in a row. Um, so given that fatigue is always multifactorial, given that recovery from fatigue will therefore always be multifactorial, it gets to be very uh, difficult to try and model the recovery from fatigue in a way that works uh, robustly, especially when you start taking into consideration individual differences as well. Um, but that's not to say I've given up, just saying that uh, we're not there yet, and until it's working well enough, it's not going to go in WKO. Phenotyping, another idea here that's based upon this power duration model. Phenotyping in WKO4 uh, could be defined as the objective classification of a cyclist as a sprinter, pursuiter, all-rounder, TT, or based on quantitative analysis of the shape of their individual power duration relationship. And you notice I'm emphasizing objective and quantitative because this is something we've been doing you know, ever since the power profiling tables were put forth. Uh, but power profiling was uh, a semi-objective approach, if you will, because yeah, if somebody's line is dramatically upsloping or downsloping, it's pretty obvious, but then there are cases where it's not so obvious. Well, phenotyping in WKO4 removes that, uh, that uh, subjectivity from it and uh, uh, allows it to be done automatically. If you want to think about it in that context, it's just an evolution of the same uh, thought processes here. I proposed power profiling back in 2003, and I based it on four durations, five second, one minute, five minute, and sustainable power, uh, chosen primarily because they largely, not exclusively, but largely reflect different physiological abilities, uh, and secondarily on convenience, you know, a kilo, it's possible to set up standards for about one minute power for elite cyclists because that's how long a kilo takes, et cetera. Um, and then that was, uh, you know, floating around in the world, and the power profiling tables are now up to version 7. 
uh, people have used it quite a bit. But then you know, Hunter in 2010 made the wise suggestion of looking at a few more durations in the idea of being here to look at fatigue profiling. And what he was observing was differences between individuals in the shape of their mean maximal power curves or their power duration curves and wanted to be able to take that knowledge and uh, differentiate between people a little bit more uh, than what was possible with just four durations in power profiling. Well, if you extend that logic to uh, onward, uh, then power duration modeling simply is to look at all durations uh, and not just limit yourself to uh, select subset. So within WKO4, in the power duration metrics, it gives you your phenotype as a rider. You know, this person, uh, their power duration curve at the present time makes them a pursuiter. Uh, as we would say, a pursuiter with uh, quotation marks around it. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll be a great pursuiter. For example, if you have somebody with a pursuiter's profile but they weigh all of a hundred kilo or sorry, when they weigh all of a hundred pounds, uh, they're probably not going to make a great pursuiter because they're just not big enough and powerful enough to go all that fast. But what, we're, what we mean here when we talk about these phenotypes is the shape of your power duration curve. This person's uh, uh, power duration curve is similar in shape to that of an elite pursuiter uh, or a specialized pursuiter, even if the absolute height of it isn't uh, the same. <clears throat> the highlighted one here in, uh, in yellow uh, is the person down here, and you can see it's a pretty flat power duration curve, typical of that of a, of a time trialist. And it's possible to uh, develop uh, even a phenotype map. We're still playing with this to decide the best way to, to uh, convey the information that would tell you not only uh, what, uh, what your phenotype is, but also sort of you know, how far away from another phenotype you might be. Uh, like this person out here, yeah, they're a sprinter, and they're never going to be anything but a sprinter. Uh, but you could have somebody, for example, who is a, uh, a time trialist by definition, but uh, could turn themselves into an all-rounder because they're close enough to the border there. But we're still playing with the, uh, the best way of, of conveying this information. The other thing related to the idea of phenotyping is the possibility of developing standards. Again, think back the uh, the power duration Sorry, the power profiling tables are just that. There's uh, tables of standards. And I made the cutesy analogy at the start of this series of four webinars that the power duration model is what happens when the, uh, the mean maximal power chart and the power profiling tables meet, get married, yada, 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 yada. Um, so related to that, it's possible to develop standards uh, for the power duration uh, metrics. And that's what these fine lines are here. And it allows you to immediately see where somebody's strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, this person's pretty much middle of the road until they get out to two minutes or thereabouts. And remember, it's an aerobic sport. Darn it. Um, and then you can see they're very close to the top rank all the way out through 20 minutes before they begin to fall off and back to the middle of the road again. Um, those fine lines correspond to uh, these power duration standards uh, that we've developed, that I've developed, where <coughs> the, they really demarcate uh, regions of the graph. So the top line here is the border between exceptional and world class. It's not what it takes to be world class. If, if you're up in this above that border anywhere, we would call consider your power at that duration to be world class. And if you're below this bottom border at any duration, we would consider your power to be that of uh, novice one. Um, and in between, novice two, fair, moderate, good, very good, excellent, exceptional, et cetera. So again, this is actually uh, uh, my wife's data. Um, against the women's standards and expressed in watts per kilogram, but what you can see is uh, you know, good to, somewhere between good and very good sprint. Um, but her real strength lie in the middle time ranges, as you would expect for somebody who was a good pursuiter and who had an FRC of, of uh, 400 
uh, joules per kilogram. All right, moving on. Uh, another thing that the uh, power duration model lends itself to is the idea of calculating individual adaptation scores, emphasis on the plural there, which is not a new idea um, either. Uh, I don't know if this was the very first time I said it, but I've been saying it for a long, uh, long, long time. Uh, it's called training stress score and not training performance score for a reason. And that is because at some point, uh, stress is not beneficial and does not drive adaptation. Um, so you have to make a choice which you're trying to model here. And even uh, I even made a, a hinted at what my thinking was. Uh, back in 2005, so what, eight years or so ago, I suggested that one could uh, start to try and derive metrics that would uh, allow you to better predict adaptation instead of trying to model stress and strain. And I made the same point in a talk I gave to UK, UK Sport in uh, spring of 2007 on quantifying training load, where uh, borrowing from an analogy that I first saw Alan Lim use talking about uh, stress and strain from an engineer's perspective where you can think of it as stimulus and response if you're doing uh, say pharmaceutical modeling or uh, modeling of neurons etc. Um, you can look at quantifying the training load or dose leads to changes in performance either uh, beneficial or detrimental. Uh, so during this talk, I uh, was pointing out how TSS was the first uh, objective uh, strain-based, um, sorry, stress-based uh, metric, and then a whole host of, uh, of similar things have popped up since then, uh, and compared TSS to training impulse, which is an objective strain-based measurement, to uh, Rusko's EPOC, which is an objective strain-based measurement, to Bannister's session RPE, which is a subjective strain-based measurement. But then at the end of the talk, I made the point that I didn't think that the, the way forward was to continue to invent ever more complicated ways of trying to quantify stress. It's sort of like been there, done that. What we really are interested in is how do we model the relationship between training and adaptation. And so the power duration model is a step in that direction. And that's about all the more I'm going to uh, say at the present time. Automatic match finding. You know, it's kind of funny. This is, this is also a very old story. Uh, I had heard of the analogy of, well, you know, you burned a match and you only have so many matches. And that's why you have to pace yourself during races. I remember in the 1970s, even though I'm a not great climber, but I'm light. I'm, you know, 67 kilograms at you know, 1.8 meters, a, a BMI of 20. Um, doing the fade early in the, you know, your district road race, when you come to a hill and you know there's not going to be any breaks, then you start at the front and you climb slower than everybody else to end up at the back because you save energy that's going to pay off when you get to the very end of the race. You don't want to burn a match that you don't have to. Same way, you stay in the saddle and you stay in low gears while everybody else around you is joking and laughing and climbing in the big chain ring, etc. Uh, you conserve your matches, keep your keep your matchbook dry. Well, that uh, that analogy must not have uh, been as widespread, or maybe it fell into disuse along the way because uh, uh, when I mentioned it to Hunter once upon a time, and I don't remember when, um, uh, he was really taken by it and. Uh, went on to write this article on the Cycling Peaks website, and he was the very first person to propose quantitative criteria for how do you define a match. Uh, and you know, he uh, shared them with me and asked me what I thought. And I thought he, I think he did a very good job. You know, from my intuitive sort of gut perspective, uh, I think he did a very good job of, of defining well, what is a match? What will, what will hurt you that it, in the long run, and uh, what uh, will not? Um, so these were the very first criteria, uh, and they're, but again, it's not something that ever really seems to have caught on a lot with people, perhaps because the, the match-finding utility within Cycling Peaks and, uh, and then WKO got broken along the way and didn't necessarily uh, do what it was supposed to do. Um, 
something that uh, I'm sure greats with uh, with uh, Kevin Williams, who did such a good job of programming it. Uh, but I digress. Um, the limitation here, though, is matches are defined simply relative to somebody's uh, functional threshold power. And the examples in the table here is, are for somebody who has an FTP of 300 watts. Well, that makes sense from one perspective in that uh, it's only when you go above FTP for an extended period of time that you really think about burning a match or a flare. Um, below FTP or even prolonged periods at FTP, you maybe think about you know a slow burn sort of thing. Uh, in both cases, you're obviously using up some of your, uh, your oh-so-precious muscle glycogen stores, but we tend to focus on the times when we use it most rapidly. Um, the limitation here is that the size of uh, a person's maximal match differs from person to person. So going the same percentage above threshold may not mean the same thing to uh, two different athletes. Well, that's where uh, FRC uh, sort of comes to the rescue because now we have a more uh, complete and explicit description of somebody's power duration relationship, i.e. Uh, their unique uh, fingerprint of their abilities. You can then you come up with objective criteria to define matches and automate the process of locating them within a file and then marking them up. And so this is actually going back to the uh, same uh, track workout that I had showed for my wife previously. So, you know, here's the warm up, here's a short effort, sort of a leg opener, and this is a flying 3K, a flying 3K, a flying 3K, and then it was supposed to be a flying 3K where they pulled the plug early, uh, but you can see the, the markup has found all of those matches. And so you could quantify them, locate them, uh, describe them in terms of their depth, their, their size, et cetera. Um, all predicated, of course, on having a robust mathematical model of someone's abilities, i.e. knowing their FRC. Uh, identification of outliers. Uh, I talked about this early on in terms of uh, short-term power. And an example I showed in one of the previous talks here, I don't remember the details, but a, a data set you know, provided to me for modeling where it's quite obvious to me, knowing that fatigue does not occur within the first uh, one, two, three seconds, or at least significant fatigue should not occur. It's quite obvious to me that these are outliers. And I don't need you know, mathematical modeling and a nice smooth line in order to spot that. But other people, would probably find it helpful. And in fact, it surprises to me how many people are sending me data which have uh, outlying points that are clearly non-believable uh, at very short durations, and they don't seem to be aware of that fact. Um, I know some cases people say, well, I only look at the five-second power anyway to deal with that. But the problem is that if the one-second power is elevated, then so too is likely to be the you know, three, four, and five-second power because this effort probably, not necessarily, but quite well, quite possibly could include that effort. So here's an example where you know these are the first two points. I don't think they're realistic. Uh, the red line is what happens if you model the power duration relationship excluding those two points. And you can see you still get an estimate of their, of their Pmax um, that makes sense in the context of what they can do, uh, or at least makes more sense in the context of what they can do at longer durations. And you know, having a nice smooth line makes those points jump right out at you. Um, but it's not just Pmax. I mean, it should be obvious that these perform the performance during here is better than the average that the person is capable of, and the performance through here and through here is not as good as the rest of the surrounding performances. Um, so by outliers, I basically mean, you know, it's like the, the uh, paper worksheets that, you know, kids do, you know, which one of these things is not like the others. That's what I mean when I say an outlier, um, something that's falling off the overall trend line why it falls off the overall trend line uh, cannot be determined uh, by the software. Uh, that would require further investigation. It could be that these outliers simply reflect uh, a particularly stellar performance. Somebody has tapered, rested, and you know they've been gunning for that pursuit uh, or 
or what have you all along, and therefore it's a standout and it falls above the overall trend line. Um, it could also be due to power meter error. Uh, the power meter was simply riding, uh, reading high that day. Um, but again, these are issues of the data set. They're baked into the data set and not really a, an issue of the, uh, the power duration model itself. Um, but if you wanted to develop objective criteria and not have to go in and subjectively decide, well, I believe these numbers, I don't believe these numbers, which my experience as a scientist is an exceedingly dangerous thing to do since it inevitably leads to confirmation bias. If you wanted to uh, develop objective criteria, yeah, it would be helpful to know something about the, uh, the biological and technological variability that you see in measuring uh, human performance. Uh, and therefore, you could think about, well, you know, how might I uh, mathematically try and identify uh, data points that are suspect and uh, at least flag them uh, or possibly automate their elimination. Um, you could envision a recursive approach in which you uh, uh, continually uh, uh, call through the numbers. You could envision using a runs test. There's lots of different ways, but you need to have some uh, understanding of what is typical variability even under the best conditions and what is uh, just a, you know, a guess. Oh, I don't like that number. I'm going to throw it out. Calculation of optimal pacing strategy. Here's another uh, potential application of uh, the power duration model, a rather esoteric one, but I uh, thought I would throw it up there. This is also something that goes way back. Um, I did a time trial at a uh, training camp in Bedford, Virginia, when Hunter had me out there way back in 2003. And we all pre-rode the course ahead of time, uh, one uh, out and back. Uh, and then lined up and did a TT. And uh, I was uh, lost to another uh, good cyclist there and great fellow. Um, and then had the opportunity later to look at both of our data files. And not only was I upset that I had lost, I was embarrassed because I had forgotten that my, my uh, SRM Power Control 4 was set that it stopped recording time when I stopped pedaling. So I actually argued with the, uh, the guys uh, from Hunter's Friends who were helping run the camp. It might have been BJ Basham. Uh, I don't remember who. Uh, briefly argued with them that they must have mistimed me because it didn't agree with the time I had on my power control. And then I realized oops, they were right and I was wrong and I had to apologize to them. But that, uh, having embarrassed myself in that manner, when I had the opportunity to review the power meter file of the guy who won, uh, I was you know, doubly interested in trying to figure out where things went wrong, because I thought I had him at the halfway mark and, and so on. Uh, so what is shown on the graph here are uh, my data in the fuchsia uh, and his data in the blue, with the, uh, the raw data are the little dots and the, uh, the smooth lines are just that, they're rolling averages, and I don't know, remember or what duration, uh, plotted as a function of time. But then everything has been normalized to our average power during the TT. And he's a bigger guy than I am. His average power was a good 60 watts or probably 20% higher than mine was. But what I was struck by when I saw this was despite the, uh, the big differences in our raw power and in our body sizes, was the very similar overall pattern of distribution of effort uh, during the TT. So you can see we both start out about this hard. We both you know, go through this early portion here uh, about the same percentage. We both raise our effort on this little bit of a hill. We both reduce our effort here. And then I made the conscious decision. This was a very uh, steep downhill followed by a very steep uphill. And on the return, I think I hit 50 miles an hour going down. So on the way up, it's very steep. I knew that was there, so I tucked and coasted, hoping to be able to sprint up the hill faster and gain time. Um, in fact, if you kind of look for where the valleys and the peaks are, I think what I did is you know, I fell behind a little bit because I didn't pedal down the hill. And I caught up by sprinting up the hill so that we're now in sync again. And I go a little bit harder up this hill and a little bit easier down this hill. 
but it looks like I've fallen behind a little bit because his he starts applying power again a little bit ahead before where I do. And he gets to the top of this hill before I get to the top of this hill. But now my power tends to be a little higher than his, so we're pretty much even. And now we go down that big hill, up that big hill, and we're pretty much even. And then I actually remember during the time trial, I could, it was like, uh, because of the rolling hills, I could see him, I could not see him sort of thing. I kind of lost a plot at this point. I lost concentration. He only had, you know, four minutes to go or thereabouts, but my concentration flagged. And you can see his power rises and exceeds mine. He pulls ahead, so he crests that hill before I crest the hill. He puts more power in here, and he beats me by you know, 20 seconds or whatever it was. Um, so this analysis, you know, I was able to pick out where I lost the race, but the real take-home message was, wow, isn't that interesting? Two experienced riders, never seen the course before, markedly different in absolute terms, end up pacing themselves very similarly. It's like, huh, that's kind of cool. Um, what that led to is trying to model optimal pacing strategy. Uh, and developed a really massive spreadsheet so that by 2006 I was doing these calculations for people who would ask. Um, where using our, our uh, validated wind tunnel physics uh, model of cycling, uh, comparing the, uh, the power that the rider is uh, producing or is uh, desired to be producing, I guess expected to be producing against their resistances in order to calculate their speed and then optimizing the distribution of power output in order to minimize the time required to complete a given course. And uh, initially, simply using normalized power as a global constraint. So if you say the override, excuse me, the overall normalized power cannot exceed a value of X for this duration of this entire TT, and then letting the, the modeling process determine the uh, way to pace things uh, works out quite well. Uh, in most cases, uh, especially if your course segments are relatively short, then uh, that's the only constraint that you need. And what you end up uh, with a, a suggested as an optimal pacing strategy actually turns out to be very close to what experienced cyclists do, even if when they don't have power meter data for feedback. And then as his is way, uh, Alex uh, has taken this to a whole nother level, to throw in a reference to friends, um, and wrote a white paper on the topic, developed a, a pacing optimization score, and applied it to look at uh, Bradley Wiggins and other people doing TTs with publicly available files and uh, generate some really pretty graphics, etc. And I don't know if that uh, white paper is still out uh, on the uh, on the web or not, but if it is, it's well worth tracking down. In fact, I even suggested to Alex at the time that he should write it up as a scientific paper. Uh, and of course, you know, being a coach, there's not much uh, uh, benefit for him in doing so, but it's it's a fantastic piece of work. Um, and I, I shouldn't say, you know, I think several of us, uh, Rick Ashburn out on the West Coast, who has also been part of uh, Endurance Nation, uh, also was playing with the idea of modeling pacing strategy using normalized power as a constraint at about the same time um, back in 2003. But if, you, uh, if your segment lengths are longer, uh, sometimes the model ends up asking for a power that is more than you can produce for that particular duration. Even though the overall normalized power is uh, within reason, the fastest way to complete the course would be to blast a, per a certain segment, say a really steep hill, at a power that is simply unattainable by that individual. So in this particular spreadsheet, as I've highlighted there in column U, uh, as a secondary constraint, I have calculated the max power available for a given duration based on the critical power model and then dictated that the power reserve, that is that you always stay below that. Um, and that helps solve the problem, uh, helps solve the problem. But if you wanted to carry this uh, uh, to a logical uh, conclusion, 
what you really would want to do is rely upon a very robust model of the entire power duration relationship. So you could apply the same logic and you know, set up your physics models, uh, use the power duration model as your constraint at any particular point in time, and then uh, vary the pacing strategy in order to minimize time. And so there's a website out there where they're doing the uh, the same thing as shown in this slide, absent the critical power constraint, simply using normalized power as a constraint. And I can't remember what the web address is. Um, but yeah, people have automated it's available on the web. Um, but it would be another application for the, uh, the power duration model if somebody really wants to get into this. Now, of course, in, in some regards, this is like you know counting how many angels there are on the head of a pin, in that as I already mentioned, experienced riders will pace themselves uh, optimally or so close to optimally that it's very very hard to argue or even believe that uh, you know is some mathematical model is doing better than an experienced rider can, uh, which I actually view as sort of a biological validation of the of the normalized power uh, paradigm. Um, if you want to think of it that way. But you can picture situations where a, a optimal pacing strategy in a general sense could be useful with less experienced riders, either a priori to give them uh, some guidelines with which to pace themselves, uh, either or after the fact to uh, analyze their pacing to see if what they did made sense. Um, or if you have somebody who's, if you're completely unfamiliar with a course and don't have the opportunity to pre-ride it, if you simply know the course profile, you could at least uh, use this approach to lay out uh, some pacing guidelines uh, that would at least hopefully get people in the ballpark to start with. And of course, that's really all the more you can expect. I mean, I, I think it's unrealistic to think, and I'm too pragmatic to propose as much as I like to play with numbers, uh, it's unrealistic to think that the day will ever come that somebody's going to be, you know, TTing with a heads up display with numbers flashing in front of them saying, do 500 watts, I'll do 505, I'll do 504, I'll do 300, I'll do 20, you know, uh, when you're going 10 tenths as the saying goes, you don't, you don't have that ability to think in that kind of depth. Um, but you can certainly put out guidelines such as, yeah, you want to hit this hill, you know, hard, maybe about 450, 470 watts. And when you get the other side, just cruise down at about 200 kind of thing, um, which could be helpful, again, if you haven't seen the course yet. And then finally, uh, another potential application of the power duration modeling approach is to other sports. And I've shown these slides previously uh, here, modeling world records for men in running uh, as of whenever I prepared the slide, I don't remember if any, uh, any men's did the marathon record fall recently. It was somewhere, you know, midsummer. So this was current as of 2013. Um, so not nearly as many data points uh, as when for cyclists, which is a limitation if you're dealing with running that you uh, wouldn't necessarily have, uh, we don't necessarily have with cycling, but simply to show that it's not uh, absolutely cycling specific and in fact if you're wondering about well how many data points do you really need to fit the curve uh, well here's an example of instead of using you know the very very many that I have been using for cycling where you can get what appear to be quite reasonable curve fits uh, with uh, far fewer number of points also uh, well seems to work with swimming as well although I'm not uh, I'm not calibrated in the context of swimming well enough, and perhaps somebody in the audience is, could speak up and say, is it reasonable to think that somebody could swim in a pool at 1.7 meters per second for you know, 40 to 50 minutes? Um, but at least you do get a curve fit with a, a reasonable prediction error, uh, even where you only have, in this case, you know, six data points, uh, which is kind of scary to be dealing with such a small number of, of values, but nonetheless, the model uh, does arrive at a uh, at a uh, at least a local minimum with respect to the um, sums of squares. And the other thing to think about here is notice that the time duration is actually rather short. So while we benefit in cycling from having uh, 
data all the way, like I said, five orders of magnitude, um, you can get a curve fit with uh, you know, data that's only spanning here a couple orders of magnitude out to you know, a, thousand, a little under a thousand seconds or that's a little, it's like 16, a thousand seconds would be uh, 16 minutes, 40 seconds. Um, so conclusion is the new power duration model serves as the basis for a number of other analyses. Uh, both already implemented uh, and uh, we hope to be implementing uh, in the future um, that could be uh, potentially very important for power meter users. At this point, I need to turn things over to my colleague, Tim Cusick. Tim, are you out there? Thanks, Andy, I am. Um, before you turn the slide, I just wanted to thank everybody for great questions. Um, I know those last two I wasn't getting to, but I think after four webinars, I've learned the skill of keeping up with the questions. I know you guys see all the public ones, but um, it's, it's uh, great to get the input and follow along. Um, I think I've got some good ones held for Andy and everything else. One announcement, there was a lot of confusion in a couple of these questions on there. Um, Andy, go ahead if you can turn the slide. Yep. So next steps in WQO, everybody. Um, We've made the determination that we're going to be expanding our beta on December 10th and continuing to do some work on the product. So we are going to announce a slight delay. There will be more details that will short and follow shortly. Um, in the interim time period, you know, we're going to continue with our educational series. Hunter uh, will be doing the next webinar. The date isn't fully set in stone, but it, it basically is. It'll come out tomorrow. I'm pretty sure everything will be uh, rocked in, but it'll be December 18th. And we'll kind of take what you just saw from Andy and actually use the software to show you how it functioned, how it works. Um, we're going to put out a release update. Um, I can tell you that, and I sent this to Andy in a hurry, I'm very sorry. The release update is December 30th. Bad typo. Um, December 30th. So just note that we will put out more information. We're going to go through the final beta test. Um, we just want to take uh, a little bit more time and make sure it's all functioning. I can tell you that taking on the task of developing the Apple and WKL uh, PC at the same time um, certainly has created some effort, but we wanted to make sure we had both available for everybody when it came public. Um, that really is the next steps coming down the pipeline. Hunter's excited to kind of take over where Andy has left off and will hopefully give the group, um, you know, uh, a very clean demo and, and show you how these tools are going to play out in WKL4. I did get the question of will, will you know coaches be trained in this? Absolutely. All of the education we're doing, I can tell you, um, there are coaches from all different coaches companies on this meeting and all programs will be open to anyone and will be listed on Training Peaks in the same format. So at that stage, I'd just like to open it up. Um, <laughs> Two questions. Um, I, Matt, I'm sorry about spoiling Christmas. Um, <laughs> we will uh, do everything we can to make it up for you with a, a heck of a final product. But uh, we're opening up to questions right now. So I'm going to start with some of the saved ones I had, Andy, and fire them at you. Okay. Um, and I know you, actually you've gotten very good at reading them now. And if you're looking at it and would rather read them to yourself, it's actually easier. Well, it, 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 uh, it helps that you had to do that spiel there about uh, this last slide because I've been very quickly looking at the pain with all the questions and the P-A-N-E uh, with all the questions and uh, you know, trying to get up to speed very quickly. So I'll let you, since you've been looking at them all along here, I'll let you though pick them out and decide which ones. I'll let you be the moderator here. Great. Let's tackle the first one. General question. And this was because it wasn't answered last week. Um, have you ever been approached by WADA USADA about um, WKL becoming part of testing for the biological passport process? After all, what better way to detect outliers? Understand that such would not be part of the objectives you set. He understands. I understand what he's saying. I understand this is not part of the objectives you set out to achieve. Huh. I can't. I can't say I ever thought about that. But but now that you mention it, I was reading somebody's blog in uh, the Mid Atlantic where they were uh, lamenting the fact that even though the uh, organization had paid for 
testing. It hadn't been uh, performed on the local masters until now. Cyclocross season rolled around and they were saying that you know, they thought they were the perfect example of uh, somebody who should have been tested because they've had a really good season this year. Um, so from that logic, you could say that, well, uh, let's establish, you know, part of the biological passport. This is your power duration relationship. Um, and then if you, uh, uh, you know, suddenly you know, uh, break out of that, then you come under greater scrutiny. Um, it's, it's certainly a logical idea. I think the, uh, I have philosophical objections against it. Uh, and you can also worry about the practical aspect. It's like, oh wait, you're going to get sanctioned for you know drug use because your zero offset shifted. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants that. Wants that idea. Um, but the answer to the question is no. I haven't been approached. Okay. Um, will FRC help you tell how many matches you have? Uh, only if you did a match finding uh, repeatedly and saw that your matchbook consistently ran dry after X. Okay. Have you tried to use the model to look at how supplements and then lists a bunch of supplements uh, affect Pmax, FRC, and FTP? Uh, yes. <laughs> I had a feeling that was going to be the answer. <laughs> All right, maybe I should expand on that. I, I'll, I'll say uh, yes, but they're they're all uh, uh, things that are not on the uh, the banned list, um, and you know the world will learn more about it in you know, 2014. What are the workout requirements in order for the software to generate an accurate power duration curve? In other words, how many rides, what effort levels, what durations? Well, somebody asked this sim a similar question before, or maybe I was uh, I answered it just in anticipation. Um, you, know, you, re you really need in your mind, you need to separate the mathematical model from the, the data that you're feeding into it. They're, they're two different animals entirely. Um, so the answer to that question becomes very context specific. I have had, as I mentioned, I've had uh, cases where people send me a single criterium file and I get what seems to be a very uh, uh, reasonable uh, estimate of somebody's you know, Pmax, FTP, FRP from a single ride. On the other hand, if you're just plugging and chugging away on the trainer at level three for months on end, um, well, your power duration or your mean maximal power curve is just a flat line. Uh, and if you, you know, apply the model to that, it's going to give you answers, but those answers are you know, not something you really want to put much faith in. This is why I was saying that you really need to interpret that power duration metrics box on the screen as you know, your apparent FTP, your apparent Pmax, your apparent FRC. And keep in mind what's been going on you know, leading into that uh, calculation. Um, what you want to do about it, uh, well again, it's context specific. In some cases you might simply say, I'm going to ignore it. I've got a plan, I'm sticking to the plan, I don't really need to know what my FRC is when I, it's January and I'm not racing until you know uh, May. Um, in other cases it might be, you know, we really need we really need to know where we stand and you haven't done any really hard sharp efforts uh, you know, to push up that part of your power duration curve recently. Uh, maybe we need to work that testing into your, into your training in order to uh, you know, just see where things lie at the present time. Um, but again, it's, uh, it's an issue of the data set and it's going to be an issue regardless of the model that you apply to it. I don't care if you want to use uh, you know, the two parameter critical power model, the three parameter model, if you want to do um, you know, uh, simple mathematical smoothing the way uh, uh, Pino and Grappe have proposed. If you want to use uh, uh, any of the other models that are out there in the scientific literature, they're all going to face the same problem. Um, so it's a matter of you know the, the data themselves uh, and not the model. 
But this is part of the reason, and Tim, I was actually going to, I was going to ask you, I recall when we first met, started mapping out uh, WKO4 back in November of last year, we had the, the <coughs> tear off uh, sheets and mm -hmm. I was, and, and we had, you know, WKO4, actionable intelligence. The reason that it's actionable intelligence and it's not yet artificial intelligence is because we're simply, we being the world at large, no one is in the position yet to start dictating at least, or should be think they're in the position to start dictating to uh, coaches and athletes uh, on issues such as this one. Um, so for that reason, WKO4 does not take the uh, curve fit and automatically plug it in as your FTP because that would be a dangerous thing to do at the present time. It is, however, focused on providing you actionable intelligence, things that you can act upon and hopefully use for the better and not drown you in, oh, look, we can download from the latest, you know, bioelectrical impedance scale that I just got for Christmas, which, you know, makes a very tiny uh, fraction of users happy, but means diddly squat because bioelectrical impedance is not a very good way of measuring body composition. Um, anyway, I'm ranting. <laughs> Next question, Tim. <laughs> um. I don't know what to keep up. See, uh, here's actually a good one, Andy. A uh, good one for the group. My power on the TT bike is different than the road bike. Will I need to separate the ride files in order to have an FRC curve for TT versus road bike? Well, one uh, one approach would be to have separate athletes and load the files into one and the files into the other. Um, another part of it, and this is where I'd actually have to talk to Kevin about um, where the ability stands in terms of defining ranges uh, which are fed into the model. Um, in an ideal world, you'd be able to select and deselect whatever files you want to model. Yeah, and I, I can give you the answer because it's being a little more on the software side, I know that. The answer is yes. You will be able to select any individual file and model it or group them together and model them. So you can group your time trial files and model them versus your road model yeah. files. That's I, great. There was a, yeah. that's, so, that's, the I, that's the way I was hoping and envi envisioning it would work because by the same uh, token if you have a file where you know the data are garbage, um, you don't have to delete it entirely, you can just exclude it from the model. Yeah, and Andy, if you don't mind, I'll answer that one question deeper because I answered about four or five of these type of questions. You guys, WKL4 is a paradigm shift. It's, it's not an upgrade. It is a total overhaul of the way data is analyzed. And I don't mean the data has changed. I also got a lot of questions. Is TSS changing? Things like that. It just, the whole thing is, is made to really empower coaches and athletes to see data, to see analytics, to support the things that you're trying to accomplish. Um, I will tell you, for example, here to really say what does that mean to give you some touch of insight, you can just grab your TT files and your road files and just range them, just put them in, in a group and then you can just overlay them. So don't think about looking at multiple charts. Think about looking at one chart with TT power duration curve, road bike power duration curve. It is a much more flexible and vibrant tool to allow you to do that. One of the places we've gotten so much pushback is we're not putting parameters on this. We want to give all the, there's so many smart coaches and exercise physiologists and everything else in the world. We're trying to give a tool to better empower. Of course we have actionable intelligence and, and we want to keep learning and taking it to the new level and supply better and better stuff. But you have more flexibility. You're going to have to reprogram your brain in WK4 a little bit, so instead of seeing a sheet of charts and trying to compare them all, the thing is what data are you overlaying? Time ranges, rider ranges, ride type ranges, so it, it's a paradigm shift, so just be prepared for it. Um, last question here that just kind of popped up. Uh, even though I know the question, no. Um, but I will, I've answered this one numerous times, so I'll answer two more. One, will these new features be introduced, in w, will these new features introduced in WKL4 be included in trainingpeaks.com? 
in 2014, they will be in WKO4 only. Over time, as these work out, there might be some of these items that come into Training Peaks um, online. The two products are so deeply related to maximize the event, you need to use them together. Um, the desktop gives you more horsepower and some other things that you can't do online, and online gives you some incredible data movement and calendaring. Um, as coaches have learned out there over a long time, and athletes have learned that it's the combination of two that really gives you the power. And the final question for you, Andy, is does the p-norm-based TSS calculation remain the same? I did get this a bunch of times. Or is that now a black box algorithm? Yeah, normalized power, TSS, the performance manager are all unchanged in WKO4. Excellent. Well, I think that wraps us up for tonight, unless anybody has a, Andy or Melissa have anything to add. Can I, yeah, give me, give me 10 seconds to Shoot. scour this list of questions and see if there's any, uh, anything that, Sorry for the silence here. I'm just scrolling through the list. I've got a couple of questions about being on the expanded beta list. You can contact at trainingpeaks.com. Just check out their website. Let them know you'd like to be on the list. We're selecting from Training Peaks users. Yeah, um, I don't see anything that uh, really would require everybody hanging on for every word and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, have we uh, made sure that every person who has posed a question gotten an answer either online or after the fact? If not, we, we need to follow up, not only for this webinar, but all of them. Um, so for those of you who didn't get your question answered, uh, you know, keep, uh, if, you, if you don't get an answer, you know, don't hesitate to ask again. Everybody knows my email. Everybody knows how to reach me. Final Facebook, question. Just whatever. <laughs> Facebook is a great way. Um, just the final question. You said Hunter's demo date was on last side. You're right. Correct. I didn't put it on there. It's targeted for December 18th. Um, look for announcements very shortly. But that's when it's going to be. Is December 18th. So I'm sorry. I should have. Put, I was putting that slide together as Andy was starting to talk. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so just know that's on December 18th for the next presentation. But um, that's going to come out through. Train peaks and confirmation of that date, and we'll go from there. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night, and uh, shoot your questions over to us. Uh, the best way to get Andy is training racing with a power meter on Facebook uh, or his personal site, you know, but I don't want to put that out there. So, you guys, um, thank you very much for attending, and um, we'll talk to you soon. Good night. Good night, everyone.